Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Coming up today on The Story. Two weeks before my 21st birthday, my father died in a car accident, uh, which was a, a terrible moment, not only because it was just before my 21st birthday and it's all about me, but my mother was actually eight months pregnant with our sixth brother. The Story. The story. G'day, I'm Jimmy Colfax. Welcome to The Story. Well, our guest today is once again Ben Evans, the CEO of Feed the Hungry. Last time we heard his background and how he became a Christian. Today we'll hear more of his story and how the Lord led him to become involved in Feeding the Hungry in various parts of the world. Once again, Ben Evans is chatting with Eric Scadabo and we'll pick up the story as Ben is sharing about the impact his relationship with the Lord has had on his life. What it's done for me is it's it's put a stillness in me and we talk about deep calling to deep. Mm-hmm. And so there's something in me that becomes very settled and I'm able to roll <laughs> uh, mm. to cope with life's adventures. Mm. And I, I mean, one of those adventures is just before, two weeks before my 21st birthday, uh, my father died in a car accident, mm. which was a, a terrible moment not only because it was just before my 21st birthday and it's all about me, hmm. but my mother was actually eight months pregnant with our sixth brother. So hmm. I'm the oldest of six. There's a 16-year gap between number two and number three. So at this time, my mother had a four-year-old, a set of twins that were uh, two years old, and then she was eight months pregnant with number six. And, you know, my father died in a car accident. So... That's a, a culmination of several things where it, it's very easy to get upset at God. Yeah. You want to blame God. Why, why does all these things happen? Mm-hmm. I come back to, and it's everyone's experience was a little bit different uh, around that moment. But for me, the verse in John 10.10 10 became very crystal clear for me. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Mm-hmm but I have come to give life and life more abundantly. And so that became what I call an absolute Bible truth for me. Mm -hmm. And when I look at everybody's doctrine, everybody's opinions about this and that, I come back to this verse and I go, well, the thief or the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So when these things happen in my life, is that the characteristic of the thief or is it the characteristic of Jesus who's come to give life and life more abundantly? So in this tragedy, in this suffering, for me, I was able to run to God, knowing that He is the one who is trying to, to wipe the tears uh, from my face. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's hard to talk about that because, at least for me, it's not an emotional experience, my father dying. And no. I don't know how much of it is because I know he's in heaven. I know mm. I'm going to see oh, okay. him again. Yeah. Uh, of course, his wife, my mother... Uh, very emotional, my sister very emotional, everybody in our church very emotional. But uh, I've never I've never felt the need to cry over mm. my loss. I've certainly lost my father. And yeah. when I became a father and I'm having children of my own, I'm going, if only I had someone <laughs> to help me be a good parent. Yeah. Uh, where's my dad? Yeah, you lost that. Yeah. Yeah. But there's kind of like this bubble that's weird to describe, but just knowing – uh, there was a peace and a, and, a, and it comes back to that settlement. And I, I, I just trust and know we kind of talk about God's will. Um, sometimes we, we think about pain and suffering as an example of God's will. But when I think, at least from my experience, I, I go back to John 10, 10, and I think this is the thing that holds me steady. Mm-hmm. Uh, God's plans for me are good, but I know that his, his goal is to bring life into me mm-hmm. and more abundant life. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, that's just how I how I roll. A, a little, yeah. I guess, a little optimistic about life. That, so it sounds uh, like. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there is a peace that passes all understanding that kind of guided you through the tragedy of your your father dying. Yeah, yeah. It's a that's an interesting verse which has really come to light in the last couple of years. I think it was during the last Olympics, and it's a, a, a maybe a 400 meter race or 800 meter foot race. And uh, you know when you when you see bad athletes, they can get lapped. Mm-hmm. You know, someone's yeah. in front and they're 
they're they're actually uh, going further than you see that maybe during the swimming sometimes on those long you know <laughs> long races. And I'm thinking, you know, peace passes understanding, and it's like we're always chasing understanding, hmm. but yet peace is lapping it. It's it's oh. so far in front of it. It's past. I never thought of it that way. That's interesting. And then I've actually just randomly listened to a Jewish preacher talking about the Book of Job, and he he made an interesting idea that actually it's not so much what I like to see now is peace is not passing, not lapping understanding, but actually peace and understanding are often in two different directions. Hmm. And when we encounter suffering, our first instinct is to understand why this has happened. Did I do something wrong? Hmm. Uh, you know, Well, that's what we want. Yeah. So we kind of chase understanding, mm-hmm. but it's often in the opposite direction to peace. And so when you look at Job, next time you read Job, think about, it from this perspective that Job, Job's friends were telling him, you must have done something wrong. That's why these bad things happen. Job said, no, I haven't done anything wrong. Then he's on the mountain, the proverbial mountain, yelling at God saying, why do all these bad things happen to me? And God says, well, where were you when I did this? Where were you when I did this? You know, when I mm-hmm. stopped the water, when I did this, that. And so God really kind of came to him and says, your perspective is very limited. Uh, there's things that you don't understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so there, there's this simple line at the end where Job says, I've met God and I am settled. Mm-hmm. And so there's this idea that Job got peace, but he didn't get understanding. Yeah. But he got peace. And once that mm-hmm. moment happened, it was a very short time that we hear this restoration, uh, restoration for his family. So in life, we're not always going to get understanding for why things happen. But if we lean on our trust in the Lord, we'll have the peace through it all. Yeah. Yeah, mm. that that's for me that's the profound. life lesson. Yeah, that's a profound lesson to learn at, at such a young age. And obviously, we want to get to how this all leads to you being the CEO of Feed the Hungry. So, <laughs> where does that come into all this? <laughs> yeah, uh, so I started with uh, with Feed the Hungry back in two thousand and four. Mm-hmm. Um, it was actually a I was offered a part time role. Uh, we were a small organization at the time. So it's a well, why, why were you even looking into a, a role like that? I, I wasn't. Uh, I was the previous director was a member of our church, and he wanted oh, okay. to step down. Mm-hmm. And he asked me, and I said, "No, thank you." And then he asked me a second time, and I said, "No, thank you." <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the third time he asked me, it's probably in the space of a year. Uh, I was actually working as a manager at Red Rooster. So we kind of always joked that I was still in the food industry. I moved from Red Rooster to Feed the Hungry. <laughs> um, still with food. Yeah, still with food, yeah. So I, I I was honestly just desperate to get out of my previous job, mm. not really thinking about what I could do in this job. Uh, so I eventually he wore me down, I, I <laughs> joke, and um, I, I took the role. It was part-time role. Uh, the office was subleased from another Christian organization, and they offered me uh, two days employment. So mm-hmm. between the, the the rest, I had a full-time job, same location, same parking spot, uh, just different hats, and uh, was able to grow. But of course, getting out of one job is no reason to uh, run a ministry. And I think about Feed the yeah. Hungry. It's a nonprofit charity. Well, I run that a, ministry, ministry just because I wanted to get out of my old job. <laughs> yeah, that's not a good recipe for <laughs> yeah, success. No, not very inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> so uh back to the cassettes still in the cassette oh, days. cassettes again uh we had a a copy of the vision of feed the hungry as told by our founder dr lester sumrall and so he tells the story that on one tour trip to israel he would take uh mainly americans but anyone who would be interested to come to israel three times a year and on one of those trips he was woken up at midnight this is november 1987 he was woken up at midnight by the Lord, and he says, I'm very concerned that my church, my children are dying of hunger before I return, mm. and I want you to do something about it. Now, Lester is uh, 73 years of age at this point, and his first response was, <laughs> like me, no, thank you. <laughs> that's not for me. Why don't you ask the Salvation Army? You know, that's mm. that's more in their role. Why are you asking me? And he felt the Lord say, no, I can trust you. And that's why I'm asking you to do this. And so, he's, of course, you know, what are you going to say to the Lord other than, yes, <laughs> yes, sir, whatever you say, sir. 
Uh, so he dedicated the rest of his life, about another 10 years, to feeding the hungry. He was a an international speaker of renown. He was mm-hmm. a much sought-after speaker. Mm-hmm. So he just took every opportunity wherever he went to talk about feeding the hungry. And uh, really these three aims of feeding the hungry, building the church, and reaching the lost. So they had a very simple model to have an open-air crusade at night for three nights and then have a two- or three-day uh, pastoral seminar in the morning to try and build the local church. And that's what we did for many years. So I got his recording of this vision. It's about a 12 minute recording on a little cassette, little 15 mm-hmm. minute cassette. I had a, a pink dual deck auto reverse ghetto blaster. <laughs> and I just put the tape in and I just press play and let it reverse and play and reverse and play over and over three days straight. Just oh, wow. Playing playing constantly i'm just i'm not sitting there I, i'm working so it's mm. playing in the background yeah but uh, after three days i stopped it because it wasn't just jesus talking to lester now it was jesus talking to me and mm. that same calling that same voice that echoes through mm. the years was saying to me i'm very concerned that my church my children are dying of hunger and i want you to do something about it and so now with the calling, <laughs> now with purpose, uh, I was able to really dedicate you know my years since 2004 to helping to feed the hungry, and I think it's been a, a good partnership for me and and the organisation. I'm kind of the jack of all trades, so it was a small team, as in just me. Mm. Uh, I joke, uh, I was asked what just, the title just is. you, nobody else, just me in Australia. Yeah, mm. uh. I joke that my title is chief tea maker because I, I do everything. You know, <laughs> I empty the bins, you know, clean the dishes, do everything. That's yeah. that's what you do. That's that's ministry. Yeah. I I guess I think about myself first as a servant. I'm a servant first in everything I do. Mm. So if I'm in leadership, it's leadership to serve. That's mm. the point. That's the mm-hmm. purpose. It's not about getting special seats in conferences or you know being treated like a king or anything like that. You use your influence, you use your position to help other people and increase them. So that's what I've done since then. Mm-hmm. You're listening to The Story. Today, Eric Scadabo is once again chatting with Ben Evans, who's the CEO of Feed the Hungry. Ben's sharing his life journey with us and how the Lord led him to become involved in feeding the hungry in various parts of the world. We'll hear more of Ben's story when we return. The Story. If this program has highlighted something you'd like prayer for, we'd love to pray for you. Call 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's 1-800-772-936. It's a free call. Or text 0401-132-888. Hi, I'm Jimmy Colfax, and this is The Story. Our guest today is once again Ben Evans, who's the CEO of Feed the Hungry. Ben's sharing his life journey with us and how the Lord led him to become involved in feeding the hungry in various parts of the world. Now, here's more of Ben's conversation with Eric Scadabo. Now, the name of the ministry is called Feed the Hungry, and I'm gathering from that that it's something about feeding hungry. Am I on the right track? You are a very clever man. <laughs> Pretty astute, ain't I? <laughs> <laughs> you should you should go on Mastermind or you know one of those yeah, TV shows. I, I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I, I'm grateful for a very simple uh, mission and a very simple name, and it really makes sense. You could, there are some organizations that do great work, but they have really unusual names, and so you yeah, have or, to think or they're doing fifty about, things at the same time. That's right. Yeah. And I think that's really, you, you touch on that. I think that's really important for us. We were given a specific instruction. Mm, yeah. uh, so 87, it's, it's many decades ago. Mm. We've just stuck true to that simple mission. Mm. There are so many great things that can be done and should be done. But God asked us to do one specific thing, which was to feed the hungry, build the church as we're doing it, and reach the lost. Mm-hmm. So we rely on partnership to look at those other aspects, to, you know, to provide clothes, to provide education as their primary uh, objective. Our role is to feed the hungry. Mm-hmm. And so you, in your leadership role, is it mostly fundraising or what do you do on a day-to-day basis? 
Yeah, it's, uh, so here in Australia, my primary role is fundraising. We we are part of what we call LACI Global. So LACI is Leicester Summerall Evangelistic Association mm-hmm. Global. Uh, so I fundraise to help the global projects. So a lot of them are run from the US, but we have offices in particularly Europe that are busy working in natural disasters, uh, civil wars, uh, those sort of locations. Mm-hmm. So whoever's the closest office is coordinating. Uh, but we are generally blessed here in Australia that we don't have many natural disasters, so I'm able to help. So, uh, I mean, we've probably distributed, we're, I mean, no doubt we are a small organization. Uh, we have less than 50 staff worldwide. And the reason we're able to keep it so small is because we partner with the local church. We want to give food, we mm-hmm. want to give resources into the local church and allow them to distribute it. We want the local church to be seen as a place of answers, mm. you know, physical answers first, mm-hmm. but then it creates conversations for spiritual mm-hmm. conversations. So we don't give food to governments. We don't give food to military organizations or anything like that. It must be to the local church, mm-hmm. and it's them that distribute the food. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> Lester Summerall, uh, two quotes uh, about the caliber of his his ministry is, what's the use of sending someone to hell on a, on a full stomach? Mm. Yeah. Uh, We're going to feed them, but we want to share the gospel. And so it's very encouraging for me to know how many people want to practice their humanity with eternity in mind. And Mm. so when we feed the hungry, it creates conversations, it creates opportunities Mm -hmm. for us to share the gospel. I was in, uh, you, you, you wouldn't plan it this way, but my first overseas trip for Feed the Hungry I started 2004, so another important event in 2004 was the Boxing Day tsunami uh, at Christmas 2004. Mm -hmm. So we traveled with a group into Banda Aceh, the Mm -hmm. epicenter of the earthquake, the tsunami, Mm -hmm. and we met with the governor. And, of course, he all the advisors are telling him, look at look at all these Westerners and Christian organizations are rushing here. There was military, there was, you know, this and that. And his advisors are saying, aren't you afraid that uh, these Westerners uh, may not leave? And he is telling us the story. And he said, why would I be afraid? Why would I send them away? These are the very people who are wiping the tears from my face. Mm. So we see a really powerful thing that most most charities are Christian. Mm -hmm. Not all, but most charities are Christian. Mm -hmm. I think it's no accident that the word charity is the word in the King James Bible that talks about God's love in First mm-hmm. Corinthians yep. thirteen. Yep. Yeah. So it's an expression of God's love mm-hmm. is helping people. And whenever there's opportunities, uh, we we can't respond to every disaster, but when we can, we go there, we provide food and resources in Jesus' name freely mm-hmm. with with no strings attached, but it creates those opportunities. And so this governor would tell me and and people like that, uh, we were we went to Phuket after that. And I, I remember being told uh, personally uh, this idea, why would my enemy be coming to help me? It, it's so strange. You know, I've been taught that Westerners are my enemy, but mm. yet you were the first ones here mm. with food and you yeah, were helping me. a good me. witness. Yeah. So it just creates opportunities mm-hmm. and we can share about the love of Jesus. And so it's with that simplicity that we operate to share the gospel in word and in deed. Mm-hmm. So a part of your job is international travel. Something you said earlier wasn't your favorite thing to do. <laughs> no, that's true. Uh, yeah, I. It's a really important for us uh, for stewardship and due diligence to make sure that food is actually getting to those who need it most. Mm-hmm. So part of our roles is we find trusted partners that will distribute the food, but it's still important for us to visit and make sure mm-hmm. that the programs yep. are running effectively. Mm-hmm. That as a small organization, we want to make sure that our food is not dumped on someone who's getting help from 10 different organizations, right, right. but yet his neighbor is getting nothing. So yeah, we are actually yeah. looking for gaps. Mm-hmm. We're looking for people who aren't reached so that we can make sure that our resources, our support is making a, a difference for them. Mm-hmm. Now, what would you say is the most fulfilling part of your role? I, I guess um, I've never been, I, I love working for the kingdom of God and I've never been drawn or desired to get a career and build my own my own kingdom. Mm-hmm. I, I've never had a desire to get a job so I can earn a, a big paycheck, uh, get a fancy car, get a fancy house, all those sort of things that never interest me. 
if I'd have chosen any career path, it would have been possibly on staff at a church mm-hmm. because I just love the local church. I love it's a refuge. It's a mm-hmm. it's a city of light that stands out. And it's funny because I mean I talk about that as I say it. I used to think when we're called to be salt and light uh, that. Uh, when it meant light, it meant I'm supposed to be a moral police in my neighbourhood. You know, or you shouldn't do that. Uh, that's not the right thing. Tut, tut, tut. Hmm. And I used to think that that was my responsibility, which was easy for me because uh, I'm a good person. <laughs> so it's easy, uh, you know, to, 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 to judge and to look at those sort of situations. But uh, our church pastor last week was reading those verses again and it just makes a very simple point that being salt and light is actually through our acts of kindness. Mm. It's through our uh, serving our communities mm-hmm. that we actually become salt and light for them. And I was like, I feel so dumb sometimes. You know, you read the Bible all the time, but you still don't see things. <laughs> mm. So, uh, well, the, the word says, or Jesus said, we must become like children. And sometimes we get a little bit too more sophisticated in our thinking and all that. And sometimes we just need to go back to the basics. Yeah, we we often have our own agendas and we apply mm. it to verses and we find yeah. things that make sense for us. But I'm just I'm grateful, uh, grateful to help and to to see the difference. And I remember there was a, a, a I was told the story. I didn't meet uh, Miguel, uh, but he was a, a young child from Nicaragua who lived on a dump. I don't know if you've ever heard or seen those stories about people who live on the dump. Mm. So Nicaragua yeah. is one of the poorest countries in one of the poorest regions and uh this town in uh, central america yeah uh, this town is actually one of the poorer towns in this mm-hmm. poorest country and these people make a living by going to the the rubbish dump and looking for goods that have been thrown out that they can sell again so someone's buying secondhand goods from a rubbish dump and i'm just thinking about the whole economy and how that's a crazy situation and uh this child lived there his family you know the dump truck would arrive and there's people running behind the truck with big poles saying, see that bag of rubbish? That's my bag of rubbish. Hands off my bag of rubbish. <laughs> I I want that one. I'll fight Don't you. Touch. That's my rubbish. Yeah. Uh, so that's his environment. And we have these beautiful missionaries from America, uh, Ken and Kendra, who are based in that country. They're feeding over 100,000 children mm. every day. Wow. And uh, seeing these children in this dump site, they went, you know what we need to do? We need to take these children to like a camp, a weekend camp, and just give them a break, give them a holiday, play some games, have some fun, and share the gospel with them, you know, like a Sunday school camp. Mm-hmm. And uh, one night uh, at an altar call, this little uh, child, Miguel, came up and responded to the altar call and then came up to Kendra laughter and says, ah, oh, I'm so glad because I don't believe the lie anymore. And Kendra's going, what lie? I, you know, we haven't told you any lies, so yeah, what lie are you yeah. talking about? And he said, I used to think I was worthless because I lived at the dump, mm. but Jesus told me that I am his treasure. Wow. And I just think about a little child that has had his life changed just simply because of a, a food program. Yeah. And when we ask people for support, uh, we, we have a program which is called Takeaway Hunger Day, and we, we ask people to make a donation because with that donation, we can actually feed a child for an entire month. Mm. And that's all the donation is used for. It's, it's mm-hmm. the food. But it actually becomes so much more. We say it's, it provides more than a meal because we do it in school environments. We provide cooked meals for children in school so they can get an education. They can get out of the poverty cycle. Uh, but it also gives us a chance to share the gospel to them. And so... It really unlocks a future for them. Mm. I I know that feeding the hungry body, soul, and spirit, those three parts of ourselves is really important, and that you can be full in your belly but still feel empty. Mm-hmm. You can have a brain full of knowledge but still feel empty. Mm-hmm. It's only when you have Jesus, when you're full of Jesus, that you actually feel full, you feel content, you feel peaceful. And so we want to give children a full life, uh, mm-hmm. but Jesus is at yep. the center. And it's probably a reflection of my age, but I still have the Donut Man uh, children's songs singing in my head. <laughs> and there's this idea that he sings that there's a hole in your heart that only Jesus can fit. And you can try and put all sorts of stuff in that hole to mm-hmm. try and fill it. You know, yep. it could uh, sex, drugs, rock and roll, mm-hmm. uh, careers, all those sort of things. You're trying to fill that emptiness in you, but only Jesus can fill it. So that's what we're trying to do, give children a full life. 
let them know that Jesus loves them and that he died for them. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. A pleasure. Well, that was part two of Eric Scadabo's conversation with Ben Evans, who's the CEO of Feed the Hungry. To find out more about Feed the Hungry, you can go to their website. It's feedthehungry.org.au. Also, to learn more about their yearly Takeaway Hunger Day and how you can be involved, you can find that information at their website also. Once again, it's feedthehungry.org.au. Finally, we'll end today with this verse from the book of Proverbs. It says, The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. That's Proverbs chapter 22 verse 9. Well, thanks for joining us for part two of Ben Evans' story and some insights into the Feed the Hungry ministry. Until next time, I'm Jimmy Colfax, encouraging you to share your story with someone today. The story. story. Just another way vision is helping you look to God daily. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.